Like we have a new game called Xantar. Mm. Xantar is a gelatinous cube that eats warriors in a medieval village. And every time it eats a chieftain, you ascend to a higher level. Beauty part is you can't get to the next level, so the kids keep coughing up quarters, you know? <laughs> <laughs> gelatinous cube eats village. I think it's terrific. Hello, welcome to the show, Half Glass Gaming. I'm Julian. I got Mandy. Hey. I got Josh. Yep. I got the Rev. That's me. And I got to tell you, baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> I have been hibernating like a mofo. <laughs> Which is really uh, not healthy for you because you started out really scrawny. Yeah, I got a little bit of a job of the hut thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is cold outside though, and and I do not like it. I I grew up in Texas, and you know I'm I'm half Mexican, so I'm double not good with the cold. Really, I don't know why the fuck I'm up here in the north in the first place. Mm-hmm. No, I mean I don't think Josh and I would be going outside at all if it wasn't for Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, we've seen the Star Wars movie twice now, mm-hmm. and you know that's pulling us out of the house. And also, I've been uh, collecting some of the Star Wars figures because I was so excited about the movie. I have a lot of affection for just little knickknack collectible things and it's like 10 times worse because I hang out with Mandy all the time <laughs> and she's got like all this insider information. I'm like, oh yeah, I know how they, they pack these toys, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. She's got all these strategies <laughs> for like finding the collectibles you want to find. Yeah, she's got a dragnet. She's very good at finding hard to find collectible toys and so you know, I've got a huge collection of Star Wars toys now, mm-hmm. which is starting to rival my Amiibo collection. And I mean, I guess since I've got most of the Amiibo figures now, I had to replace that with something else. And we found the Star Wars toy thing. So it's been pretty good, except when Josh tries to buy Star Wars toys, it's kind of a disaster. Yeah, I have been cursed. And this this curse has followed me my entire life. And it only applies to Target stores. No matter what line I pick in a target, Mm -hmm. it's going to be the slow line. And Mandy will back me up because she's been shopping enough with me to be kind of blown away by how bad my luck is at picking lines in target. You'll see a line of like three or four people that have full carts with like 40 items each. And you're like, nope, skipping that line. And then the next line has like one guy who's trying to buy a pack of bubble gum. And you're like, okay, I'm going to get in that line. Mm -hmm. And you get in that line and the guy his credit card doesn't work Mm -hmm. and the bubble gum's the wrong flavor so he's got to go pick out a new one and then you know his daughter comes up and is like oh you know let's go buy this thing too and yeah and so you, you stand there and then you watch all three of the people with 40 items in their cart get checked out and like walk out the door and you're yep. still sitting there behind the guy with the gum. Yeah, here's a here's a pro tip for you. It's not necessarily based on the amount of items the person has. It's the person working the checkout line and the people who are pushing those carts. I've re- revised my strategy now. So I don't look at number of items anymore. Mm-hmm. I look at, okay, which customer looks like the least amount of problems mm-hmm. and which which checkout person looks the most competent yep. at handling problems should yep. they arise. And I'm still getting it wrong no, every single I time. I made it both your self-checkout and then it wouldn't recognize the weight of any of his <laughs> items. And so he had to like twice get a cashier come and wow. like key it through. I mean, he That's just... That's impressive. He can't yeah. do it. Next time, just give your money to Mandy and let her go through. Well, he lets me pick the line now and it's a little better. <laughs> My luck is starting to rub off on her. But, you know, for a while, it was working out pretty well because I w- we would get to the checkout and be like, Mandy, pick out the line because I can't do it. Well, you know, a curse will only let you use a loophole so long. But you're still going back out there. I don't even know how many targets you've been to at this point. Mm, five or six. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Really, Star Wars is the big reason you're going back home, though, too. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of Star Wars Battlefront, as anyone who's listened to last week's episode is probably aware of yes, by now. Yes, we know, mm-hmm. we know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, what is this Battlefront? I mean- <laughs> 
But one of the things that's been bugging me, I've been arguing with people on Reddit. In the Star Wars movie, there's a line where there's two stormtroopers and one is not wearing a helmet and the, the other is like, who gave you permission to take off your helmet? And people are like furious that you're allowed to play as a helmetless stormtrooper in Battlefront. Mm-hmm. There was a whole thread on Reddit about it. And I posted a, rep- a reply that was like, every stormtrooper in Battlefront was given permission to take off their helmet, plot hole closed. And it got like downvoted to a bl- Bolivian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to take this moment to um, personally uh, thank you for your service, for going to war with these stars and being <laughs> on the battlefront. Um, <laughs> God bless you. A while back, we had a conversation about how Star Wars feels more arcadey than a lot of other first-person shooters, and we kind of started an argument about what that term means. Mm-hmm. And so I've been kind of chomping at the bit to talk about that some more. And Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's finally time to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, look, I brought a sack full of quarters and I'm ready to really get in in, an in-depth conversation going about arcades. Uh, But before we do that, I think I'm going to call a quick break. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Wheelie and 2XAA, of course, Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron Voltenson as well, uh, Retrovolve.com for hosting uh, this uh, podcast, of course. You can also venture on over to Half Glass Gaming. Uh, where you can listen to it a second time. And not only that, but find a, uh, a, a list for every episode that kind of uh, just touches uh, on all the uh, game titles that we mention in each episode, if you're interested in finding out more about those or playing them or whatever. Um, of course, we're on iTunes as well, uh, where it is your civic duty to give us a five-star rating. Uh, we're also on Stitcher Radio, blah, blah, blah. You can find us in the uh, aisle six at Cub. Um <laughs> So with that, we'll be back, and we're going to talk about arcades, arcade arcadium. Boom. Welcome back from the break. Uh, thank you for inserting your coin. I am ready for a new challenger. Like all of our conversations generally, we like to start off with uh, kind of defining what it is that we're going to be chatting about. Um, and I've always been one who's been uh, searching for a concrete definition of what it means to be arcadey. I mean, I've often times heard it sort of equated to any type of game that you could find within a classic arcade style. And I would say it draws upon certain tropes associated with old arcade games, mm-hmm. like the easy to learn, hard to master, really flashy like power-ups, more short-term mm-hmm. games rather than, you know, making long-term progress. Like the idea that you're putting in a quarter and so you're going to be walking away from this game mm-hmm. your typical on. token arcade format well yeah literally arcadey means you know like an arcade game but that definition itself isn't so cut and dry and mm-hmm. it's like so what makes a video game like an arcade game and i think a lot of the features are you know like the things mandy mentioned one of uh, one of the primary things that I see as arcadey is sacrificing realism for a very specific type of experience, Mm -hmm. you know, using power ups, like grabbing a slice of pizza and having it instantly fill your health or giving you the power to spit fire or something like that is completely unrealistic, but it makes the game more interesting to play in a short burst. Mm -hmm. Whereas something like a level up system that you see in a lot of modern video games isn't arcadey because it requires a long term investment. And mm-hmm. in an arcade machine, you don't really have a long term investment. Mm-hmm. Look, I would struggle with defining a game like Far Cry, let's say Far Cry 3, Far Cry 4. You know, you're this one man who seemingly has an entire arsenal hidden in your back pocket. But instead of grabbing a power up, you know, they actually kind of try to go through the, the motions of you pushing a bullet through your wound and, you know, wrapping it up. Um, you know, where would you classify a game like that? The Far Cry series is there's a few areas in which I would say it's arcadey, mm-hmm. but I think it's the opposite of arcadey in a lot of ways. You mm-hmm. know, like a vast open world is. Definitely not something that you would have in an arcade experience. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like you said, this very realistic kind of drawn out process of like, you know, taking the knife and and jabbing the bullet out of your skin and like showing the whole process Mm -hmm. and then like wrapping it in order to heal. 
an arcade game would just give you a power up and mm. you would just like walk over the power up and just instantly heal because the arcade experience is all about cramming as much fun as you can into a period of like two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. I also think that one of the most important parts of arcade design is that games have to give really strong feedback so that people always know why they failed. Because if you feel like the game is cheating, you're not going to put in another quarter. If you feel like, oh, I know what I did wrong, I can do better, then you're going to put another quarter and try to fix it. And I think that's led people to think that arcadey games are too easy or Mm -hmm. to associate being arcadey with being easy easy but i don't think it's about simplicity i think it's just about clear feedback i mean even if you know exactly what you're supposed to do that doesn't necessarily mean what you're supposed to do is going to be easy it just feels attainable if you know what's right and it has to to be visible in order for you to want to spend the money to right get past that or like audible too like you know instead of you know in far cry you get shot and maybe there's a thump and you see the screen turn slightly more red but like in an arcade game it'd be like and like the screen would flash and it would be like something very very obvious so that you know like oh i know my character got hit Mm -hmm. it's very obvious that my character just got hit and that all feeds into i think uh like it's all the way that it continues to get you to feed in quarters uh People have done studies mostly on MMOs uh, these days, but the principle is the same. Uh, the gratification and reward system in your brain. You know, when you level up in an MMO, there's this big flashing light. You know, there's, you know, this sound. You know you did something good. And then it slowly, like, meters out. And the higher level you get, the longer you get between those, you know, gratifications. Arcades are, arcade games are more designed to give you that instant gratification just bam 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 so it's a very it's a much shorter experience but you're much more likely to like not want to quit because it you're still in that like early stages of being gratified Mm -hmm. every time you do something good and that's why like a lot of arcade games uh when you feed in a quarter you know it'll make a little reward chiming sound Mm -hmm. you know like everything about an arcade game is designed to stimulate some uh form of the reward function in your brain well the mmo has an additional benefit over that because in an mmo you have both long-term and short-term goals and in an arcade cabinet you don't really have a long-term right i was i was mostly just using that as an example of the gratification that people are going to also be familiar with you know that that is a good example i just think it's important to make the distinction between like the, the mmo will give you both types of feedback i've done articles on this and used um psychological studies and stuff to, to back it up, um, primarily about Call of Duty, you basically have signals in your brain, pleasure signals, and you've got two types. And one is a short-term gratification signal and one's a long-term gratification signal. And a game like Call of Duty or an MMO is very good at feeding you both simultaneously, whereas an arcade game is going to sacrifice that long-term gratification for a very mm-hmm. very short term one you don't get to play the game for 10 hours mm-hmm. you you get to play as long as you've got quarters and so yeah some of the time you weren't even playing towards an actual like end completed level so much as a score you know the highest score that you can rack up right you know 80s style arcade games is, mm-hmm. is very much about you know getting a high score or like the atari 2600 a lot of those games were <laughs> never-ending games, and you would just compete for a score and see if you could beat your score. Now, I think one of the more evident series that has sort of spawned from and survived past sort of this arcade, I would say, is like a, a fighting game. Um, and then, of course, there's now this resurgent in sort of like side-scrolling brawlers. I mean, Yakuza is the first franchise that I think of. I mean, because combat is so arcadey mm-hmm. in the Yakuza games. Like, it's the loud sounds and sort of the ridiculousness of it and not striving for realism really the really just, loud guitar music that all of a sudden kicks in when you start yeah. kicking yeah. people and i mean josh has been playing yakuza 5 and there's a super gross sound effect for one of his moves and it's so loud and like i can be trying to do anything like sitting near him working or something and i hear that sound effect and i know exactly what's happening yeah i've got a move where like once i get a guy on the ground i like grab his face and rub it against the concrete <laughs> <laughs> and it just makes this disgusting sound. And it's, 
it's usually a finishing move and mm. and it's like almost difficult to look at because it's so violent. Mm. I mean, and it's not he's not actually scraping at you at his face off, but you know, that really loud visceral sound effect is just super arcadey. But you know, like Yakuza as a whole isn't arcadey at all. It's like run around, explore and do whatever you want. I mean, you mm. can play arcade games. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. uh the the Yakuza series isn't that arcadey because it's, you know, a lot of open world, a lot of running around, a lot of really, really long cutscenes and story events and stuff. But it still has super arcadey elements. But yeah, it does have super arcadey elements. I think a game that for me perfectly um, exemplifies sort of this arcade element is like the Tony Hawk series. Oh yeah, Tony Hawk yeah. is incredibly arcadey. You know, you're timed, you're trying to rack up the biggest score, you're mastering moves and and your moves are super ridiculous mm-hmm. yeah you've got turn on mood physics when i played <laughs> tony hawk big head mode i mean yeah you've got two minutes you've got you know a list of goals and it's like how many of these goals can you accomplish in two minutes you know you're racking up a score you're doing ridiculous stunts that mm-hmm. are impossible you know you've got a loud soundtrack you've got all these really arcadey sound effects. You can and, play as Spider-Man. And, yeah, you can play as <laughs> yeah. Spider-Man. It's, it, Tony Hawk is a very, very arcadey game series. Well, and, I mean, even, like, talking about it and listening to you, you know, it's it's a, it's a fond memories, fun times, you know. So why is it that the term arcadey is often perceived as being negative? I think, and this is me being a little cynical here, and I, I admit that up front, uh, but he I is, think... Uh, currently drinking Cynic. I, I am, <laughs> Uh, Surly Cynic Ale, that's, that's the name of the beer I'm drinking. Um, I, I think it has something to do with, uh, the desire for the video game, uh, art form to mm-hmm. be recognized as such. Mm-hmm. Like, people worked really hard, uh, to like get into the public consciousness that video games are art. And not always, but a lot of the time when you're talking to people just, you know, casually about artwork or whatever, they kind of connect the concept of art to the concept of, you know, introspective and and ponderous and deep. And it's not necessarily. Art Mm -hmm. is just, you know, something you create. But people have that idea. So they've wanted to, like, focus on that kind of stuff for their games. Mm -hmm. And they want to say, oh, well, you know, this is what a video game should be. And so now they're like, oh, well, you know, this bright lights and, and, you know, loud sounds and whatever, that's, that's not art. You know, it's not good enough. That and there's always the desire to go, well, you know, I'm an adult now and that's what I played when I was a kid. So as an adult, I should play adult stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, like, I don't think any of that is necessarily conscious, but I think that's a lot of it. Mm. I mean, I think that's a really bad argument because <laughs> like, you know, the blockbuster movie can exist, you know, right next to art films yeah, and but things movies, like that. Yeah, but movies have been out uh, as a medium for a lot longer than video games. So, like, they, the movies already had their age where people were like, oh, well, this is this is what an art movie should be. And it, now it's gotten over that. Right. But, I mean, video games have been around for, you know, 40 years, 40 plus years. And, and movies oh, have been around for over a century. Well, yeah, movies so. movies have been around since the late 1800s. I think movies started becoming in, like recognized as art in like the 30s or 40s. And so yeah, there was like a, you know, 40 or 50 year period. So we are we are with video games approaching that mark where it's it's either a yes or a no, which mm-hmm. I think I think we can all agree that it's it's a yes. But that doesn't mean that all video games have to be art in well, order no. for and and plus I I think anything that gets created is is art. So like, oh, well, does this arcade game count as art? That's that's a stupid question. But I think that there are people who have this idea, not consciously, but like, you know, somewhere in, in, in the bowels of their head that, oh, well, you know, for it to be art, it has to be <laughs> it, right. And for it to be art, it has to be, you know, deep and somber and serious mm-hmm. and whatever. Julian's expression at the phrase bowels <laughs> of your head. I burst my lips. <laughs> I look like I was the coach of the uh, New England Patriots. <laughs> Our 
Katie games by design are super accessible Mm -hmm. because, you know, anybody should be able to walk in having never played it before and put in a quarter and at least make some progress. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that or can't figure out what to do, you're never going to put in more money. And there is a small but very vocal contingent of the gaming population that does not want video games to be accessible at all. And, and you you know, it seems perhaps that currently there's been, I don't want to say a drought, but a fewer um arcadey style franchises yeah ssx exactly which is one of my favorite video game franchises Mm -hmm. of all time but ssx used to be tony hawk with snowboarding it used to be ridiculous it used to be crazy flashy moves power-ups crazy high scores and they took that and brought it to the ps3 and added like treacherous tracks and made it a lot more realistic and the original version of that game actually had even less Mm arcadey stuff than the version that was released because the reception to what they showed it was uh, originally shown as SSX Deadly Descents, and the whole trailer was showing, like, look at how dangerous and intense these tracks are. Look at how realistic this is, which is the opposite of what SSX used to be. It was really, how many tricks can you do? Mm-hmm. How, can you get them to play the song Tricky by Run <laughs> DMC? Because you've done so many ridiculous tricks. Yeah. <laughs> And they toned it down a little bit and added in a little more arcadey stuff, but mm-hmm. it never, it, I didn't really like it, mm-hmm. the PS3 version of SSX, and it didn't have the same feel as the previous games, and it's disappointing, and I've seen uh, complaints about FIFA 2 that the 2015 game that they released was a lot less arcadey, and people didn't enjoy it as mm-hmm. much because they didn't really want it to be super realistic. See, so, you know, I think that's actually the sports uh, genre in general, with the lack of, like, zany basketball games and those uh blitz football games yeah you know, those are like, the only sports games i like mm-hmm. it's like um the property ownership legal battles have pushed out sort of this arcade element in exchange for super hyper realistic you know kobe sweating look at his trousers yeah. and you know and i mean i think there's absolutely a market for that and i'm sure if you're super into football like a super realistic football game is a lot of fun mm-hmm. but you know i want both things to coexist i want ridiculous football games where you can throw somebody 300 feet in the air yeah. a, uh, while a play makes a crazy sound effect oh. because the other one isn't for me mm-hmm. a really good uh, style of game that expresses exactly what you were talking about is the pro wrestling genre of games yeah. uh, you know so i like i know what real pro wrestling looks like obviously uh and a video game is never going to be able to do that you yeah you trained under wasserman i I trained under wasserman the best trainer in the uh minnesota area obviously that is that is the mark right the mark a guy who knows his uh, yeah i thought i smelled a little wasserman on you yeah right (laughs) i I just want to make it clear i trained under terry fox he trained austin aries that's important anyways um so like when the wrestling video games first started coming to home console uh it was it was much more arcadey you know it was a very uh you know you beat nine or 12 guys and yay you were the champion it was basically a fighting game a lot of punching a lot of right and so as the games have progressed you know there's been more in deeper story modes uh there's been you know this attempt to try to have realistic blood etc etc and exactly like you said and i think part of that comes from once the games left the arcade and started coming to the home consoles and started being able to do more because they had more cartridge size, you know, went to CDs. It just, you could do more with the technology. Mm -hmm. People started wanting more. And then once they're like, oh, well, here's all this stuff you can do. Why aren't you doing it? Developers started trying to do that more. And like the frog that you slowly turn up the heat with, like nobody realized, wait, where are our arcade games? Well, to be fair, you can now remake Final Fantasy VII in WWE story mode. So it hasn't been a total wash. Well, there you go. Well, and, and I'm not I'm not even complaining about the way these games have turned out. Like, I love the, the WWE wrestling games. They're a lot of fun. Uh... But they are noticeably different. Like, if you take WWF Warzone, which Mm -hmm. was released on the PlayStation, uh, and compare it to even the first uh, WWF wrestling game released on the PS2, you can just see a marked difference. And it's not just graphics. It's not just, you know, the size of the roster. It's literally how the game works and, you know, the different aspects of it. Originally, it was, here's your move list. You do this combo 
combination, and then the the cameras flash and you mm-hmm. body slam the guy. Mm-hmm. And now it's you know you got to jockey for position and manage to grapple him just enough. And like you're they're trying to make it more realistic in order to I presume enhance the gameplay value. Mm-hmm. But the end result is that now we've left this short burst of fun that anybody can pick up and play and brought it into this oh well I have to figure out exactly the right tactics to wear down the guy to mm-hmm. use just just let me body slam the guy well and not even that but like there are modes now where you literally are rewarded for finishing a historical event step by step by right. step it's like literally scripted right even you know basketball and uh, other sports games are, are doing that step by step thing mm-hmm. I, I really do think the arcade sports game is is a, a lost art and I remember, you know, as a kid, we had things like NBA Jam, yeah. which was ridiculous. And it was, you know, I mean, I liked basketball as a kid, but like the ability to take a flaming basketball and play as Bill Clinton mm-hmm. and and slam dunk from from across the entire court was mm-hmm. super fun. Yeah. And have everyone, you know, cheering, he's on fire. And like, yeah. it was yeah, boom, boom shakalaka, shakalaka. You know, breaking the backboard, yeah. setting the net on fire, doing magnets. all this crazy stuff. There was another game, and I don't remember what it was called, but it was on the Genesis. And I just remember there was a stage hazard that was a little puppy dog on the edge of the mm-hmm. the the court. And if you walk too close to him, he would like jump up and like bite you in the butt and pull your pants down. Double dribble. And so was it double dribble? Well, you could pants people and double dribble. So I can only imagine. <laughs> and uh, there I mean, was there's a whole genre of pantsing basketball games. Yeah. And there was another game called uh, Pigskin Foot Brawl, which was also in the Genesis. And the premise was that you played as either actual vikings or actual like medieval knights Mm -hmm. and he would play against each other and there were stage hazards there were like you know death pits on the on the on the course you could pick up a spear and murder people and if one team was doing too badly the entire crowd would start chanting ogre ogre (laughs) and a big ogre would come out and help the team win and then (laughs) Usually what ended up happening was the other team would do so badly because they were getting creamed by this ogre that that they would bring out their own ogre. And so <laughs> then you've got, you know, two teams with these big green ogres fighting each other and murdering each other. And That's it was awesome. It was so great. And you just don't see that anymore. Mm-hmm. And sports have gotten so, like you know meticulous at providing like oh you know let's let's really focus on your on your batting stats and yeah. let's really focus on this stat or this you know this element of making a very realistic sports simulator mm-hmm. i don't really know why that can't exist alongside you know these murderous football games mm-hmm. where you've got spears and and things like yeah. i don't know where that went because that type of gameplay it just doesn't exist anymore. And I know they, they like remade NFL Blitz and they, they remade, remade NBA Jam. NBA Jam mm-hmm. But they didn't do do well. Like they mm-hmm. didn't sell very well. And that's why they stopped making those franchises. Well, I mean, I guess you could say the same thing as, for me at least, it appears to be happening in the um, racing genre. Burnout. Yeah, was Burnout is my favorite. Franchise, an incredible success. Um, but, you know, that seems to slowly have kind of been swept under the rug, and now it's just like Need for Speed is sort of vying still. But um, I mean, I haven't played Need for Speed in a few years, but the last time I did play it, it was super arcadey, mm-hmm. and it was like you know jumping through billboards and mm-hmm. you know doing all these different things where there would be speed checks, and you'd be like checking your speeds against your friends and things like that, mm-hmm. which was very arcadey. Yeah, I think, though, you know, certain games, Gran Turismo came out and sort of was the leader for a while. What was the Xbox One? Forza. Uh, Forza. Forza, which kind of uh, has released sort of a more arcadey offshoot in Forza Horizon, I believe it's called. It seems kind of like sports. It's, it's, it's just geared towards gearheads and uh, meatballs. And uh, you know, <laughs> I want to be Bill Clinton handling a pair of flaming balls. Okay, that's what I... <laughs> Harken back to, and I miss Bill, Bill Clinton driving a monster truck mm-hmm. through a billboard and with I, an ogre on it. An ogre on it, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, hell, I, I think some people kind of when when Skate came out and sort of promised this more realistic 
um, approach to skating. I think people thought that was like because everybody was upset with how arcadey Tony Hawk had gotten and it played itself out. I think in that example, they just released too many that had kind of gotten so far off base of what the yeah. original. Um, and then unfortunately, they released Tony Hawk 5, but they just didn't have the money or the time to produce a solid game. I know the skate developers have specifically said that they designed the game to not be that arcadey and then any arcadey elements that they did have that you could toggle them on or off mm-hmm. so that people really had the option of playing a slightly more arcadey or a really way more realistic skate simulator. And I mean, I think that's a good approach mm-hmm. to give people that flexibility. And a lot of arcadey stuff is super easy to turn off. Mm-hmm. If you're really bothered by points, like removing points from the UI is not a complicated thing to do. And it would be cool if more developers gave players that option. Yeah, Skate was a cool franchise. But I I will say touching on uh, massive open world games, which sort of seems to have sort of popped up and become more and more prevalent, almost sort of in some cases even filling the void for the absence of arcadey titles, you know, games like Just Cause. I think is, you know, the answer to yeah. like... And Just Cause is absolutely arcadey in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, hang gliding to <laughs> catch falling cars and throw a person out of the car and yeah. then drive the car and land it to the ground. Mm-hmm. There's there's nothing not arcadey about that. Yeah, I'm sure you can measure the distance that you sort of fling somebody's corpse or you know, something <laughs> ridiculous to that in Saints Road 3 and 4, similarly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking about. Yeah, I mean, well, even, even GTA, yeah. 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 Right. And I heard GTA 4 was a lot less arcadey than GTA 3 and yes, 5, but I, I never would, played GTA 4, so I, think, I can't attest to that. Yeah, I think there was more of a, an approach to realism in GTA 4. I played GTA 5, though, and it's definitely still pretty arcadey. Yeah. <laughs> I, GTA 4 is not arcadey to the point that somebody has talked about uh, having finished the game, like all the missions, mm-hmm. and then it's just like dry. Driving around in a wasteland because nobody wants you, nobody calls, and there's nothing mm-hmm. to do. Well, and I think in mentioning GTA, even going back to what you were saying about the skate developers, I think GTA has also done that with the stats menu where if you want to know, you know, your scores and your stats, it's there. You just got to kind of go find it yourself. It isn't sort yeah. of billboard plastered on the screen. No, and I think that's a really good compromise. And I mean, I love that stuff mm-hmm. and I don't mind having to poke around and look for it. But if it puts off other players, it's not a big deal to me to mm-hmm. have to go check and find it. Yeah. Although to some degree, I feel like all modern gamers uh, have an aspect uh, an arcadey aspect to their game playing, uh, just as a matter of course. Mm-hmm. How many games these days don't have trophies and achievements? All the ones on Nintendo systems. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Nintendo doesn't know what the fuck they're mm-hmm. doing. But like you know, trophies and achievements. It's like there's, it's a thing. You can Xbox, turn that off too, though. Well, yeah. you can, but like you know, it's just those are the default. Like well, every and, game and, has those built in. You know, on Xbox, there's even the uh, the, the gamer score specifically. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and on consoles, I mean, they're a requirement. Right. Um, a certain, I think it's like a thousand points on Xbox or something you have to have as a prerequisite if you're designing a game. Right. So and that's and that's very arcadey and mm-hmm. like that's just something that has happens as a matter of course. I would I would disagree. I don't think trophies is that arcadey. Mm-hmm. I mean it's it's like a meta goal that you're working toward, which is something that you couldn't really get in a three minute experience. It's you know it's, it's I feel like you've never tried to make sure that you had ass at the top of the top scores uh, for as long as possible at an arcade. <laughs> oh, ass. You know, because you could put in three three initials, so you put in right. ass, and mm-hmm. that's, that's what you try to do. <laughs> for me, like, trophies and achievements is is about getting players to experiment in ways that they won otherwise, mm-hmm. and you know, rewarding players for like, hey, let's wander off the beaten path for 20 minutes and find this this crazy hidden Easter egg that we put in this game Mm -hmm. and then let's reward players for doing so, which is not how you're encouraged to play an arcade game. And I mean, I guess you could say that, yeah, with, you know, leaderboards and things, um, I don't think that leaderboards and trophies are a direct correlation, though. Like, I think that leaderboards and trophies certainly have multiple benefits. They mm-hmm. they absolutely encourage players to do experiment and do weird shit. I mean, can you even but, compare your trophies with anyone you weren't friends with, though? 
on the PlayStation, it just tells you a percentage of how many people playing the game, I think, overall has gotten. Right. Yeah, and that's actually kind of fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Some Like, sometimes I'll get a super easy trophy and, yeah, and see the like percentage is low, and I'm just fuck? trying to figure it out. It's a mystery <laughs> yeah. that I can't solve. I like it. <laughs> I mean, there actually are ways to see people's trophies who you aren't friends with on PlayStation Network. There's several ways to do it, actually. You can look through a list called Players Met, which is basically anyone you've played a game with online, and you can see their trophies. You can search a player by name. So if you wanted to see, like, a Big Balls McNutter Squash's trophies, <laughs> you can uh, type in Big Balls McNutter Squash and find out what trophies he earned. There are also sites online where you can track your PlayStation trophies and things like that. However, you can also delete trophies from your public profile. I know you can do it on the the PlayStation Vita. I don't know if you can do it on the PS4 or not. I'm assuming you can. Uh, But you can delete your trophies so other people can't see them, but they still count towards your, like, ultimate trophy score or whatever. So what everybody did with that Hannah Montana game on the PS3? (laughs) Right. I do think, though, however, the answer to arcades these days, people are carrying around with them in their pockets at all times. It's the mobile games. Yeah, and I mean, there are a lot of terrible mobile games, Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of really good ones, too. And absolutely, they try to offer a super accessible, super addictive, easy to pick up and play experience and some of those games are coming to at least handheld consoles too there's one game i've been on the fence about getting on the vita called pocket rpg Hmm. and it's supposed to be a super arcadey traditional rpg and i'm really curious about how that would play out Hmm. well and there was a lot of bad arcade games too so you know like the the fact that there are bad mobile games doesn't make are just a lot of bad games there are there (laughs) yeah history of bad games i mean more bad games than good ones 90% Ninety percent of everything certainly. sucks. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But no, I I fully agree that uh, mobile games, you know, Facebook games, that's the the descendant of arcade games. They're designed for short bursts of entertainment, immediate feedback. I play the ever loving shit out of the Jeweled Blitz on Facebook, and it's a big thing mm-hmm. to me to be able to say, hey, look, there's my score at the top of the leaderboard. I beat all my friends because I have a million points. My top score, by the way, is. Two million two hundred thousand on without, <laughs> and that's like on the normal thing. I feel so proud of that. Mm-hmm. I have to tell everyone. Well, I mean, also like arcade games, they nickel and dime the fuck out of you. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, sometimes it's a good thing if you really come up with compelling reasons for people mm-hmm. to put in their dollar ninety nine. Yeah. Instead of a quarter. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I I spent money on Fallout Shelter. I got yeah. a couple extra robots and. Unfortunately, after that, I mean, the game was pretty much just on autopilot. Took all the challenge out of it. But. Yeah. And I've bought extra spins and stuff for Bejeweled Blitz. I I do this thing where if a free game really entertains me, I go out of my way to give them my money somehow, no matter what, mm-hmm. even if I don't need the thing. So, you know, I've bought coins or spins or whatever in Bejeweled Blitz because I've spent so long playing it. And it's a lot of fun. These people designed a game. They deserve some money for it. On PlayStation Vita, there's a game that's a Bejeweled Blitz ripoff, and it's called uh, Treasures of Montezuma Blitz. <laughs> and it's... That's uh, a great name. <laughs> yeah. It's free to play, and I played the shit out of that game Mm -hmm. you know you're allowed to play like five times and then you know there's a counter and then as time progresses in in the real world Mm -hmm. you just you automatically earn more credits to play and if you get like a high score and beat your friends then you get more credits to play and yada 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 and i haven't spent a single penny on it but i played an embarrassing amount of hours in that game Mm -hmm. well that's montezuma's curse (laughs) Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's my target curse. Look at your life. <laughs> I've done this to you. <laughs> There's a, a mobile game I really want to get called Nico Atsume Kitty Collector. Mm-hmm. And the whole entire point of the game is to, like, lure kitties to your yard mm-hmm. so you can just have, like, a million cute cats. What and is it baby take care of Nico Atsume Kitty Collector. Just let that wash over you. <laughs> And I like that mobile games allow you to play with things like that, that you do have some long-term benefits in that you can have a lot of kitties, Mm -hmm. but it's really just that short-term play 
say that feedback of getting like a loud meowing sound alerting you that you have a new cute kitty <laughs> in your yard yeah. and like not in-depth strategy so much just little bits of fun yeah i mean i, I take the the light rail to work you know it's about a 15 minute ride every day 30 minutes a day and it's just <laughs> just short enough where like playing most vita devoted sort of like console handheld games just isn't beneficial but uh, a good mobile game on the phone you know i mean it's like you're lost in it you can set it down there's some point to it but it's not like ultimately you're trying to get that whatever boss beaten it's just kind of like a little jaunt and that's how it was for me in the arcades i mean i'd go in i'd only have five bucks you know put in combat tribe and maybe a little top gun or you know what i mean sure you've got to be careful though i um i was on the light rail one time and i was just kind of hanging out and i there's this girl sitting across from me she's sitting there like texting on her iphone and all of a sudden you know the doors open mm-hmm. and a dude jumped out of his seat grabbed her phone and jumped out of the door like oh, yeah. right before it closed oh yeah see that kind of stuff happens but i took the light rail to work every day for six years mm-hmm. and i never had any of my stuff stolen or saw anyone mm-hmm. get their stuff stolen well you did you have your your laptop almost jacked well i got sucker punched i presume maybe they wanted my laptop but i don't know they ran off after they hit me mm-hmm. <laughs> See, what I do is when I get on the train, I just lick my phone. And that works. Yeah. If you lick it, no one else wants yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, why are you licking your phone? You're like, <laughs> Candy you Crush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. So are there any game genres or even specific games, uh, franchises, whatever, that you feel like an arcade version did it better or is like the best representation? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Yeah. Entertainingly, Dungeons and Dragons, which is a tabletop role-playing game, uh, the best representation of that comes from the D&D arcade games, uh, Tower of Doom and um, Chronicles of Mystara or some, something. There, there were two of them. First off, they're just great representations of D&D. The classes are there. Uh, the way the spells work are there. And, like, the way the monsters work are there. Like, there's a troll boss, and the only way you can kill the troll is by using fire somehow. Otherwise, the troll just keeps rehealing itself after you beat it because you can only kill trolls with fire. So then the game also does this thing where it lets you choose the paths you take. And, you know, the story isn't complex. It's not a deep story because it's an arcade brawl. But it has a branching paths that you can take, which is something that a lot of arcade games don't do. Mm-hmm. But it's a D&D arcade game, so it represents that really well. Hmm. Gold, Golden Axe uh, did that a little bit. Golden Axe did that a little bit. Uh, so, you know, it does that, and that's great. Uh, in the first game, Tower of Doom, there's a dragon that it actually warns you, like, three times, no, this is really fucking difficult. You probably don't want to do it. And they're not wrong. The dragon's breath weapon is an instant kill if it hits you. But it only uses its breath weapon three times, which is completely in line with the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. So, like, if you know the mechanics of the system, you can kind of figure out how to plan stuff in the arcade game. And that's really neat to me. What about that yeah. spell? Oh, yeah. So it even has the the best divine spell ever. Sticks to snakes. I'm absolutely fascinated by this. The Reverend told me about this earlier, and I was like thinking of all the ways that that spell would be useful. And there's so many things you can do with that. Like, I was just, I just imagine this like army of cantankerous old goblins that are all using walking sticks. And you're just like, you're like, sticks to snakes, motherfucker. And they all like fall over because they, you know, they can't walk anymore mm-hmm. without their sticks. And then they, they get bitten <laughs> in the face by their, their snakes. Or like the best one I think I came up with was like, you know, dude standing under a tree and you're just like sticks to snakes and the entire tree turns into snakes. What if it turned into one giant snake? <laughs> that would be just as good. Like a giant Medusa freaking like monstrosity. That would be amazing. To be fair though, any army that consists of any creature that's cantankerous and using walking sticks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's not going to be a difficult <laughs> army to defeat under no. any circumstances, mm-hmm. but the most fun way to defeat them would be sticks to snakes. And this mm. is why the sticks to snake spells has managed to survive since basic D&D. Everybody's like, that's fucking hilarious. That's great. 
if I were a wizard in real life, I, I would want that spell. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It'd be great. You think about like fire and ice spells and like the typical spells. No, 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 no. Sticks to snakes. That's, that's my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. That's and it's awesome. biblical. It is biblical, which is why it's a divine spell and not a wizard spell. I think um, one thing I've noticed that's definitely a, a holdout from the arcade era that's still very much prevalent in games is uh, eating food for health, which we've discussed uh, back on our uh, food episode. But um, what are some other things that you think uh, modern developers have learned from classic arcade titles that you still see? The thing for me is still that really strong feedback that I don't think a lot of enough games provide that, like mm-hmm. the idea that you know exactly why you failed when you failed. I wish developers would focus on that more <laughs> because it's really demotivating when you don't know what you're doing wrong in a video game and that's probably one of the main things that'll get me to put down a video game if i just can't figure out why mm-hmm. i'm screwing up yeah and i can't do any real problem solving because i don't have the information so uh more than anything else that feels arcadey to me i want that really strong feedback i want to know exactly what went wrong and i don't care if you have to sacrifice realism to do it because enjoying games is way more important than mm-hmm. realism to me i mean i think a lot little bit of it remains in in you know what I said toward the beginning of the episode about the long term and short term gratification. I think there are developers who think about okay, we need this game to be gratifying in the long run, but we also need to trigger that short term gratification part of your brain, and so they do things. And mm-hmm. you know I've talked about it several times, like the. Th- the thump sound effect in Call of Duty mm-hmm. that's like an instant gratification type feedback that's telling you like oh you hit this this target or things like that mm-hmm. or um you know you still you still see power ups in video mm-hmm. games once in a while collectibles I, yeah, collectibles for sure, yeah. No, and I love collectibles. And collecting orbs was the basic premise for uh, Crackdown, and, you know, all the other shit aside. <laughs> so what you're saying is Crackdown is basically a modern, gritty retelling of Pac-Man. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that was great about arcade games is they were only as long as they needed to be. A thing I noticed when we were playing all these brawlers is that they were really short. Right, and Streets of Rage 2 got criticized for being too long. Yeah. Right. Like, I'm not saying they should make every game shorter, but I am saying not every game needs to be long or needs to have a huge amount of stuff in it. Unfortunately, we live in an era where not long enough is a curse, I think. Well, me. I think you're right. Yeah. Because, not enough content. Yeah, hell. Battlefront, you know, it all comes full circle. <laughs> you know, you had to give him that launching point. You know he's going to talk about it. <laughs> well, well I, I talked about it last week, and and, and I'm good. Mm-hmm. Well, I talked I, about it on Reddit a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, like, Battlefront, an example of a game that leans more towards being arcadey. I mean, it does it does have, a lot, like, a lot of non arcade things. You know, sure. level up progression system. Right. You know, things like that. Either way, you know, we've mentioned that throughout the episode fond memories of arcades and arcadey style games and do you think there is a legitimate market for arcadey style games oh absolutely i mean rocket league rocket league is pure arcadey the kind of sports title that we were talking about and that's Mm -hmm. been just a monstrous success Mm -hmm. or even like world of tanks which i've never played but i understand it is one of the most popular games and their whole thing is super realistic tanks super arcadey gameplay Mm -hmm. the gameplay absolutely is arcadey in in how the explosions happen Mm -hmm. etc it's it's great it's a very interesting game actually Mm -hmm. I think as developers start doing more multiplayer only games, because it, it is obvious that developers are kind of licking their lips and looking at multiplayer only. But I think as that happens, we will start to see more arcadey type games. Do you think it's more of an arena for um, smaller development companies as opposed to AAA t- uh, developers? I hope so, because I think there's a market for that that's not necessarily being served and mm-hmm. That's being pushed out of AAA development mm-hmm. a little bit. Too much of a gamble, perhaps. For, yeah. You know, multi tens of millions of dollars game. No, absolutely. Like B games or indie games or anything from a smaller developer mm-hmm. is where I turn if I want something that's just really fun. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, well, I think arcade games definitely have a place and we're starting to see a little bit of a resurgence in certain arcade genres, uh, side-crawler beat-em-ups and uh, things of that nature. I think um, 
there definitely is a market out there for more of an arcade style sports game outside of perhaps this hardcore sports demographic guys like me and Josh, you know, <laughs> we're not sports dudes, but we're sort not of sports a, bros. We're not, well, you know, look, we're specimens of physical superiority. <laughs> okay. We don't like to dunk on people, but we can. <laughs> But even, you know, the racing genre, there's been discussions of possibly uh, a spiritual successor to Burnout coming out, which would be exciting, I think. Um, Tony Hawk tried, failed, but that was just more of a... Um, yeah, they tried to really quick make a Tony Hawk game before their license expired, and it yeah, was blew up in their face. bad. Yeah, it was Tony Hawk's amateur hour. <laughs> they replaced Tony Hawk with Adam Sandler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gave him a, a Subway sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Actually Instead of a skateboard. Fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> which completely altered the subway level. But uh, yeah, and I, I think I would consider Battlefront not necessarily, obviously, a full fledged arcade style shooter, but it has more arcade leanings and trappings than you perhaps might uh, find in other games. And it's done phenomenal in the sales. It's a powerhouse. It's the reason that Josh gets up in the morning. Gotta get up before all the 12-year-olds get out of bed and kick his butt. There's there's a window of time between like 9 and 11 Mm a.m. where the hardcore crowd is still sleeping or eating their Taco Bell breakfast or whatever. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) you get to about 11 at night and it's just like, it's hopeless because all of those people are online. They're all drinking the Red Bull, they're mm-hmm. eating, their know, Doritos. <laughs> eating their Doritos and yeah. just going at it with their cheesy, sticky controllers and their <laughs> menacing grimaces and their terrifying their, gamer handles. Can't, mm-hmm. can't compete with their Tito stained fingers. And their Big Balls McNutter Squash <laughs> <laughs> gamer tags. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, fuck, man. In in discussing this topic, I think I've realized kind of how much I have actually missed um, that certain arcade aspect to gaming. Definitely a lot of games still have arcade uh, roots in the arcade design, but there definitely needs to be more of an arcade balance. It's not a bad thing. It's it's not a four-letter word. You know, it's not something disgusting that you find in your uncle's closet and you wish you had never seen, but he saw you see it, so now it's like there's this weird thing going on. (laughs) You know, and with that, I'd like to say thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, you know, we'll look forward to further discussion in the comments. My main man, JM, holler back at your boy. <laughs> Half Glass Gaming, Season 2, out. Unless I was locked in some sort of like medieval jail where I was not given food and I was starving. (laughs) Wearing an iron mask. Right. Shackles, tattered rags, sleeping on a bed of straw. I mean, the straw is pretty comfy for uh, iron mask prison. Yeah. Yeah. Real real luxury there. Well, I'm a creature of comfort. (laughs) But uh, I'll take my iron mask with a set of straw, please. (laughs) You know what? I don't even know anymore. I'm just going to (laughs) drink.